We're so happy to have with us um, Doug Harris tonight. Really honored that he wanted to come to Conway and speak with us. He's going to speak tonight about indigenous ceremonial stone landscapes in New England. Um, these are, and I love this phrase, I don't know if it's your wording or not, uh, living, living prayers of stone, um, which need our help as they are threatened by development, by infrastructure projects, think the pipeline, by ignorance, uh, by vandalism, by forestry, going in cutting lumber. Um, Doug Harris is the Deputy Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Narragansett Indian Tribal Historic Preservation Office. Did I get that right? You got it. <laughs> and he specializes as a preservationist for ceremonial landscapes, um, along with representatives of the Pequot, the Mohican, the uh, Wampanoag Tribe of Gayhead. Uh, Doug has been working with the National Register of Historic Places to standardize the identification of indigenous ceremon ceremonial stone features across the Northeast. So we want to give Doug a warm welcome to Conway. <laughs> welcome to our department Thank you. I have heard so much about Conway. It's a truly <laughs> an honor to be here. Uh, most of it I've heard from Eva Gibbon, who insists that you all are special. <laughs> so, and I trust, I trust that he was worth it. Well, to let the landscape speak for itself. We come by that in a very interesting way. In 2006, I was asked to consult at Turner Falls Airport. Anyone not know where Turner Falls is? No. <laughs> So you all know where it turned out. You have to do it. So. Um, at the Hanneman site, um, Mr. Hanneman had an amateur archaeologist, had been collecting Paleolithic artifacts for many years. And he informed the airport manager that they existed there. And when the airport decided that they were going to get funding from the Federal Aviation Administration for an extension of a runway. The airport manager did the responsible thing and said, you have to have archaeology. And so as a part of the archaeological process and pursuant to the National Historic Preservation Act, Tribes were invited to consult, and the Narragansett tribe, having historic involvement in the Turner Falls area, coming out of the massacre in 1676, we participated. During the archaeological survey at the Hanneman site, we were observing uh, archaeology in a heart, and I identified something that indicated to me that on the other side of the runway that there were activities. I went over there, and in walking around, it was in the fall, almost winter, I began walking in leaves, and I could feel discrete piles of stone underneath the leaf cover. I used a stick and my foot to clear away some of the leaves, and these were, in fact, ceremonial stones. So I went back over to my colleagues, the archaeologists, and said, you need to come over and take a look at this. And they came over, and then I had a very interesting experience that I had experienced before, and that was the condescending communication which was Dougie. Um, these are just stones from that stone wall over there. They were piled here to erect that stone wall. And I said, well, first of all, that's not correct. But that's not a stone wall. That's a ceremonial stone row. They did not know what I was talking about. And what they then indicated was that 
since you seem to feel that this is something important, what we will do is that we will put in a matrix of 100 test pits. We'll get a permit to do that. And we will then prove what is or is not here. Well, they put in the 100 <coughs> test pits. They found no artifacts. And then they came back with pat, pat, pat. Um, <coughs> No artifacts, no significance. Now, this is archaeological parlance, um, including the pat pat on the Buddha's <laughs> head. Um, for communicating with Indians who have a difference of opinion, um, what came out of that circumstance was that we were told that they were going to continue to work on the runway and that they were going to use the hill as free sand and gravel <coughs> to extend this runway. I challenged them. I took the fact that I had challenged them back to the elder medicine man, Lord Running Wolf Wilcox at the reservation. I said, Mr. Wilcox, we've got a problem. They plan to destroy ceremonial features on the hill. And I don't know what I can do other than if I have to, I'll lay down in front of a bulldozer. And he said, well, maybe you won't have to do that. <laughs> Let's take a look at the situation. He said, you should not anticipate that tribal oral history or tribal lore will be sufficient to save sites. At this place, you may need to let the landscape speak for itself. I perceived that I had been given the word from on high. <laughs> I left his office feeling quite confident that all I had now to do was to let the landscape speak for itself. And it only <coughs> took me three days to figure out I did not know what the heck he was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but it was two weeks later that I got a phone call. And that phone call came from this young lady right here, mm -hmm. Eva Gibbon, who said, since I was about eight years mm -hmm. old, I've been taken into the forest to see these stone sites. And as an adult, I began to document them. And now I have um, shape files, more than 80 of them. Would that help you? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she had done a great deal of our work for us. Um, we submitted that along with our report to the National Register of Historic Places. And the chief of determinations came up to the site to visit the site. He wanted to see it for himself. And his recommendation was, I'll go into some of the details, his recommendation was this should be a historic district. And with a radius of more than 20 miles from the ceremonial hill, anything within that radius was worthy of an archaeological assessment. I was quite pleased. Yeah. Uh, it was far more than I had expected, and uh, we've learned a great deal since then. But we've learned mainly from the process that Eva had developed to let the landscape speak for itself. And through letting the landscape speak for itself, you begin to see what the relationship of stone features are to each other, and primarily to constellations. Mm -hmm. Because our process evolves from the United South and Eastern Tribes in 2002, created this resolution, number 22, 
and I'm going to give you the key sections. First of all, it had to do with when the United South and Eastern Tribes was 24 tribes instead of the 27 that we are now, and the 33 that we're about to become. There have been six tribes added to the Federal Register from Virginia, and we expect them by next year to be members of the United South and Eastern Tribes. That's federally recognized tribes from Maine to Texas. Now, at this time, we were dealing with Acton, Carlisle, Concord, Lincoln, Littleton, Stowe, Boxborough, and Westford. And we were dealing with those towns because every year, Jick Davis of Carlisle would contact our office and ask us to come out and take a look at stones in Carlisle. And he was doing this at the behest of Mr. Benfield, on whose land the stones were. Mr. Benfield was interested in putting, in utilizing forestry funds. He was going to cut forests, and he wanted to make sure that these stones were not going to be impacted if, in fact, they were of tribal significance. First year, Jick called, and we began to call him the crazy guy in Carlisle. <laughs> The second year he called, and we knew he was the crazy guy. <laughs> the third year, I was asked by the head of my office, John Brown, who was the medicine man to be. He's now the medicine man of the tribe. He was the tribal historic preservation officer and my boss, and so he got to ask me to go up and see what this guy was talking about. I went up. And the crazy guy was not crazy. <laughs> it was the most pristine ceremonial stone collection I had seen. And so I, was, I wasn't used to going outside of Rhode Island to identify anything. And it was a major leap. And it began a process that we now engage in extensively. How did it come about? I was on my way to the Mohegan Reservation where the United South and Eastern Tribes was having an annual meeting. And I get a call from Jick Davis and he says, Doug, we got a problem. <laughs> right next to the Benfield property, they are now planning to put in McMansions. Yes. And they're going to clear land that has ceremonial stones in it. What can we do? I said, Jick, I don't know. <laughs> I said, I'm going to go to this meeting. I'll see if we can get a resolution to address this. Maybe that can be used. Well, this is the resolution we ended up with. And it has several very important pieces of information. The first is this. For thousands of years before the immigration of Europeans, the Pawas or medicine people of today's New England region used this sacred landscape to sustain the people's reliance on Mother Earth and the spirit energies of balance and harmony. Now that, those are keys into what our belief system was. It was based on our relationship to our Mother the Earth and her relationship to our Creator. And in their relationship, Everything else is manifest. Human beings come into being. Every tree, blade of grass, flying thing, swimming thing, walking thing, all are the offspring of our mother the earth. So our belief system is that we have reliance on mother earth and the spirit energies of balance and harmony. Out of that comes the belief that what a stone grouping is, is a set of stones that have been prayed into and placed on our Earth Mother's bosom, calling for her to rebalance and harmonize an area which is out of balance as a result of a life being taken. So if a person is killed by a bear 
or is killed by another human being, the spirit energy of that place is radically altered and disturbed. And anyone traveling through that area would be impacted by that energy. And so it was determined, and this is not every stone feature, but in many instances, that a prayer should be spoken into a stone and placed there. And medicine people would do that, and then the general populace would do that. And then we know from Ezra Stiles, who became the president of Yale University, that as a missionary, he used to walk with tribal people near these places, and they would walk more than a quarter of a mile out of the way so they would not have to do that ceremony in his presence. Mm -hmm. Now, I recently met an offspring of Ezra Stiles up in Pepper. She said, I'm a descendant of Ezra Stiles, and my family is now going through his papers at Yale University. If we find anything, we'll share that with you. So I'm expecting to hear some very interesting things. But a corroboration by a very reliable source is that Indians dealt with these. Um, and many of you who may have Scottish or Irish ancestry might call them Carnes. Mm -hmm. And if you're in Scotland or Ireland, you'd be spot on. Mm -hmm. But if you are in Algonquin territory, we would refer to them as Manatu, spirit, Hasunash. Manatu, Hasunash. Hasun is the word for one of the words for stones, and Hasunash is many stones. So I would request of you that in this region you cease calling them cards or stone pines <laughs> and call them Manatu, Hasunash. It has taken us since 2002 to get to this part of the resolution. United South and Eastern Tribes, New Set Tribes, wish to partner with the towns which have stewardship of these properties in order to create historic preservation plans that will support the permanent protection of this or these sacred landscapes. Last year, a year before last, we reached out to our first town, and that was Whalen, Massachusetts, and asked them to participate with our four tribes, the Wampanoag tribe of Gay Head Aquinnah, the Mashpee tribe, I'm sorry, not the Mashpee, the Mashantucket Pequot, and the Mohegan tribe, and the Narragansett tribe. Those four tribes presented a multiple property listing to the National Register that defines the properties of ceremonial stone landscapes. And just as you would define the properties of a red barn of Vermont, and you would not have to then do a full write-up about what a red barn of Vermont is, <laughs> the same would be true with ceremonial stones. We're in that process with the National Register. And we are appealing to towns to have a memorandum of understanding with our four tribes so that two things can happen. One, we can speak to the issues of the air conditioning unit. <laughs> the other two things are that we can bring to town the empowerment that we have as federally recognized tribes that can be brought right to the town's jurisdiction but cannot cross over. Your town's jurisdiction is your sovereign base. Once you kick the king and the queen out, you became the sovereigns of your towns. New England was no longer the sovereign nation state of the king.
king and queen of England, but it was yours. So in your jurisdiction, you are the sovereigns. So what we're attempting to do is to establish memorandums of understandings with you, the sovereigns, because the Commonwealth of Massachusetts refuses to acknowledge ceremonial stone landscapes. Mm -hmm. Ever since the events at the Turner Falls Airport, where the National Register said, these are tribal, and the State Historic Preservation Office said, no, they're not, and they said, we will print your opinion, <laughs> but we will disagree with you. They have been taking the position that they don't have jurisdiction. You just had an instance with an attorney who wrote that, that he made contact with them, and they stated that it was not within their jurisdiction. I then immediately sent that off to the National Register, just so they have it in their records, that Massachusetts does not deal with ceremonial stone landscapes. So, we come to you, the people, the sovereign and ask your involvement with your historic commissions, you have the right to have agreements with anyone you wish who can assist you in your preservation program. We wish to be your partner. This is a mana to Hassan. These stones presumably were placed there as prayers to our mother the earth. I wasn't there. I don't know. So wherever I cannot verify by my own presence, I will give you my opinion. This is on the Narragansett Indian Reservation, and this is another form of Manitou Hasanash, stones on a boulder. No. These stones, I'm sorry to report, are no longer on this boulder. This is Upton, Massachusetts, and we consulted with this landholder. He wanted to put a cell tower in this ceremonial stone landscape at Pratt Hill, and because under federal law, we had the right to consult and to offer our opinion. One Sunday, he went up with his back home and played golf with these stones. There are silver linings to this cloud, and I will share with you in a bit. First of all, these stones, which now exist in a pile behind, there was soil which accumulated. And this summer, we tested the soil. A representative of a federal agency who I'm not allowed to speak the name of until we get the results, came out and she said, we can use this. That soil has been at the base of where those stones were ever since the stones were removed. And she did a test, with the assistance of Eva, she did a test of the soil underneath a black cloth. She took a sample, and it's her belief that her system can determine the last time that that soil saw sunlight. So we should be able to date the placement of those stones. So that's silver lining number one. Silver lining number two was that this gentleman, I use the term, was, came to a town meeting with his son and his daughter because the children had been harassed in school because he had done something wrong to the Indians. And he came to the town planning board to say that it was his intention to sell this land into preservation. Well, two years later, the Narragansett Tribal Historic Preservation Office had won uh, funding as a result of a mitigation for something else that had been destroyed. And we went to him and we said, um, 
were you serious about selling that property? He said, yes, 32 acres. He said, I have it on the market for $400,000, but I'll sell it to you. No, it was $600,000. He said, I will sell it to you for three hundred and fifty. dollars So we now, after having established a 501c3, the Narragansett Indian Tribal Historic Preservation Trust, we are the proud protectors of Pratt Hill. So, um, we have two ladies in uh, Upton who are the caretakers. And if on the last Saturday of every month, they need guided tours from the chamber that's one mile away in the valley, from the chamber to the stones on Pratt Hill. And we required that the chamber and the stones on Pratt Hill be mapped because it was tribal lore that that chamber was the viewing position for all the stones on Pratt Hill. Yeah. So you can reach out to Kathy Taylor, and I'll give you a number for her. And uh, you can participate in a tour of what is now in Heritage Park the chamber and Pratt Hill, which is the protected property of the Narragansett Tribal Historic Preservation Trust. Right across the stone wall that separates the DCR land, the Upton State Forest, from the property on Pratt Hill, there is this circle. And as you can see there, there's a shadow that's being cast. And we believe that this is a ceremonial calendar. And so uh, whether by sunlight or by moonlight, the shadow is cast. And we believe it's cast between the spaces to establish ceremonial times of year. And we're still ground truth in that to confirm what is this? It's a turtle. It is a turtle. Head, carapace, front paws, there are rear paws, and a tail. And the head is usually pointed in the direction of the winter solstice sunrise. This one is exquisitely detailed. But sometimes all you will see will be a head and a shell. It may be a large boulder with a a head sticking out. And sometimes, as I have encountered, it may be a very small stone with a head sticking out. In Sandusfield, Otis State Forest, um, I had the experience. And we often do surveys with several people, some tribal, some non-tribal some male, some female. And uh, the reason is, is that not everyone comes equipped with the same sensitivity. I consider myself fairly sensitive, but at Sandusfield, I was there with the uh, representative from the Mashantucket Pequot. Young lady is the state, is the tribal historic preservation officer. And we were at this collection of stones, and I had been drawn there because I could feel some energy. And she walked up right behind this one boulder, and she says, it's right here. It's right here. Oh, when someone's that emphatic, I usually take a step back. And um, she could not stay the next day to help us reveal that area. But there was a boulder, and it had an overhang. And the young man and I who were working on that found in the dump a stone that was about the size of my head. It was rectangular with rounded corners. And in one of its corners, there was a head. It was a turtle. I had never seen one that small. But for her, it was right 
<laughs> I've learned to appreciate that uh, as much as I would like to be the most sensitive person in the pack, often I'm not. But I'm wise enough to know that when a sensitive person steps up, to step back and give them the opportunity to identify. Next slide, please. This is a serpentine rug. That is a serpent, and that is the serpent's head. If you are in Pennsylvania, the head is not a profile. It is flat, mm -hmm. and it is wedge-shaped, and it's referred to as a viper's head. And that's in Pennsylvania. But in these environments in New England, it's a profile. Now, there are several characteristics to a serpentine row. One, as you see the serpent's head. Two, usually it undulates. And three, its tail is often in a body of water. A spring, or a stream, or a lake, pond. Uh, sometimes you won't get that far. Somebody will have cut off the tail and developed a field. But those are the elements we look for. And then there is a fourth element. That fourth element comes about as a result of this characterization. As above, so below. In the constellation of Scorpius, which has Antares as an identifier, you will see this formation with Antares as an identifier. And this is the serpentine feature. Uh, and the Cherokee referred to it as Uktena. I will use the Cherokee terminology for it because we're still in the time of year where it is, pardon the expression, taboo to speak its name. But it is a horned serpent with Antares either in its forehead or its throat. And the star Antares is then seen in a niche behind the head. That's an orange stone that quite often should be found on occasion. I've not found it, but it's expected to be found there. So that is a serpentine rope. This is a Manitou stone of the forms of Manitou. This is on Tur at Turner Falls, head, shoulders, waist, loins. And this was found by me when I was inspired to call Norm Muller. Norm is the conservator of art, or he's now retired, but he was the conservator of art at Princeton University, the museum, the art museum. And Norm does a lot of work in Pennsylvania. And uh, I was inspired, for me, it was the ancestors saying, this is the person you need on this day. Ted Temrick, who is a filmmaker, was doing uh, interviews of town uh, select board members at the hill at Turner Falls Airport. And what I was instructed to do was to make sure that Norm Muller was there. And I called Norm and I said, Norm, we're going to be at Turner Falls. I need you to come up on this Saturday. He says, Doug, I can't make it. I said, what do you mean you can't make it? He said, well, my wife has me curtailed to no more site visits. <laughs> I said, come on, man. I need you up here. He said, I'm sorry, but my wife has said no. She said, I've, I've done my quota. <laughs> I said, well, look, if it's about your quota, your, it's money, we'll pay, we'll pay for your transportation. I'll make sure you have a place to stay. You'll have a, a, a meal stipend. Please, see what you can do. Well, he got permission from his wife. <laughs> And he came up. And so I'm being interviewed with the uh, woman who was the chair of the select board. 
And all of a sudden, on the other side of the field, I hear, Doug, Doug. And it's normal. So I go over to see what Norm is talking about, what he needs me for. And just this much, you can see the lichen growth, was being revealed. And when we pulled away the rest of the duff, all under here is the rest of this Monarchy stone. And this was just opposite something else I'm going to show you in a bit. Next slide. This is another form of Manatu stone. And this form is pointing to the southwest. And the southwest is important because it is the direction to Kaltantowit's house. Kaltantowit is a primary spirit energy for the Narragansett, and it is from Kaltantowit's fields that Crow brought the agrarian tradition to the Eastern people in the form of kernel of corn in crow's bean. And in each ear, crow delivered kernel of bean and squash. And that delivers the three sisters and the tradition of farming for our indigenous people in the East. So Kaltandawit is very important. It is also to Kaltandawit's house in the Southwest that when you die, you wish to go. That's where you wish to reside, where your spirit should be. Next slide. This was the stone row that my archaeological friends were telling me that the stones that I was finding under my feet were a part of. This was a stone wall. Well, when I walked over to see this stone wall, what I saw was that, that, that. And what it meant to me was that there was a triangle. And if you stood on the base of that triangle, what you would be witnessing was Mount Pecumtuck and the sun at the time, August 10th, 11th, and 12th, setting in that notch. And it depicts the highest concentration of the Perseid meteor shower. It is also a place behind that setting sun are these standing <coughs> stones at Burnt Hill in Heath, Massachusetts. And this is the highest concentration in the time of the highest concentration of the Perseid media shower. So we communicated this to the National Register and said, oh, by the way, coincidentally, the Narragansett still at this time of year have a tribal gathering the second weekend in August. Mm -hmm. And the feature of that tribal gathering is that any family who has lost a loved one during the course of the year can dance in the circle, the medicine circle. And they would come in from the northeast and go out to the southwest. As in ancient times, it was a time to do ceremony, and the belief is these meteors are spirits of people who have passed away during the course of the previous year. For some tribes, it's all people. For other tribes, it's only medicine people. For other tribes, it is warriors. But it is the time when the Perseid meteor shower carries these into the southwest into Katantuwit's house. Mm -hmm. And Katantuwit's house, by the way, is in that part of the galaxy where Uktena and Scorpius occupy. This is on the Narragansett Reservation. This young man is the eldest son of the current medicine man. And this is an observer's seat for observing the ceremonial stone features. This is that seat, and there's an effigy figure here. Some would say it's a dancer. Others would say it's an Adela Adel throw. We had a problem here. We had just done the mapping of the ceremonial stones on the reservation. 
and we had identified through the mapping process the stones that were of ceremonial significance. One problem that we had was that these stones were going to be blocked by a health center that had been funded. And I was presented with the design and it was blocking all of these stones. I ended up writing a letter and sending a report to the tribal um, chief, Chief Sachin, and I said, we've got a problem because these, this instrument that has been handed down from the ancestors to the tribal youth allows them to learn astronomy and allows them to learn geometry. And if part of this is blocked, their ability to learn those will be impaired. And this is Winter Milky Way, Summer Solstice, August 13th, which is the same as the Perseid Media Shower, the Equinox Sunset, October 31st and February 12th, Summer Milky Way, the direction to the south, which we're just really beginning to fully fathom. Winter Milky Way, Winter Solstice, Summer. All of these were going to be blocked. They were going to be blocked by this building. Ultimately, what happened was that the chief sachem sent me back a letter and said, don't worry. Even if we have to lose the grant, we will not block the future generations from being able to communicate with an instrument that was left behind by their ancestors. But what was re the remedy was to, after submitting a problem to the physicist who we worked with. He said, all you really need to do is to rotate the design 70 feet, and then we won't have the problem blocking those alignments. So we got the designers to rotate the building design 70 feet. And we now have this wonderful health center that's not blocking the ceremonial stones. And the incidental virtue was that on the other side of the building, there was a stone feature, which at the time of the fall equinox, at sunrise, sends the shadow of an upright boulder through a space where two other boulders are, which we would call an aperture. And it sends that shadow right into the entrance way of this facility. <laughs> now, I'm assuming that that's a good thing. I haven't had the medicine people tell me yet that I made a mistake. <laughs> but it's, uh, it is wonderful. This is a split boulder, and it's an angled, horizontal split boulder. Usually, the splits are vertical, and the belief is that these are stones with prayers, either to keep something in or to keep something out. I was not there, I don't know. But this is one of the boulders, and one of the features that is seen from that observer's seat. This is not a ceremonial stone. This is referred to as a signal rock or a cup and saucer rock. And you can find them all up and down the East Coast. And they were used by signalers who were stationed at boulders like this. And upon get, being given instruction, they would signal through the bedrock, not through the air, but they would thump this onto the bedrock. And that would send a code to the next position. And that code might say, there's a runner coming through, giving safe passage, or that code might say, oh my God, the Mohawks are here, hi. <laughs> <laughs> we have better relations with the Mohawk in subsequent times. But there was a time when we were born with the Mohawk. This is the mouth of the Upton Chamber, and it is from this chamber that you can view the stones up in the front. 
here. This is water. And if you go to the Upton Chamber, be sure you wear your boots because that water is always in place. And the town acquired the chamber. It's on a plot of land that they refer to now as Heritage Park. And a mason was asked to refurbish the entranceway because this lentil stone had fallen to one side. And what they decided to do with the stonemason was to ask him if, in fact, he might be able to repair this plumbing problem. <laughs> this is a side view. And a person stooping down here would be looking out through here. And we'd be looking up to Pratt Hill at the stones. And then you would see the stones, and the stones would be aligned with different constellations. But in my infinite wisdom, which was suggested by the ancestors, I put this before our physicist. And I said, what can you make of this? And he said, well, if that's water, it may be a reflecting device. And a person who would be standing here looking out, if that person was looking at the reflected surface as well, would be able to get 17% more viewing time if they could also view through that reflection mm -hmm. as a mirror. Mm -hmm. So I ask that they not correct the plumbing problem. They mm -hmm. might, in fact, be a feature of this <coughs> particular chamber. This has a corbelled roof. And uh, as most chambers do, not all, but most, it is covered over. You have a chamber that is also in ground and is covered over that is up in Goshen. And uh, we're very much interested in that one because we believe it might have some internal features that make it unique. This is another form of chamber. Um, this is in North Smithfield, Rhode Island. And it's on a property where the landholder wanted actually to put his house there. But he left this alone and put his house on the other side of the property. And it's now protected. This is at a place called Black Plain Hill. This is also on Black Plain Hill. It is at the, beyond the fence line of a Nike base that became a National Guard. And it is our belief that this is a standing bear, a bear standing on its hind legs. And this is a bear standing on all four. And this line, we believe, with discussions with our physicists, is a part of an interpretive line surface that is seen to move and would have been a part of the medicine tradition. And you're still studying it and learning about it. This is a bear's head, and that is an observer's seat. And what you would see would be those two bears. Let's go back to the two bears. This we refer to as an artificial horizon line. We see it in many other places, and usually what it indicates is at the time of the fall equinox. What you will see is this, the Big Dipper. Now, in the Mohawk tradition, and in the Iroquois tradition, this is not a dipper, but it's a bear. And these are three hunters who are chasing the bear. And at autumn, they catch up to the bear and wound the bear. And what you see in the red trees, the leaves turning red, is the bear bleeding. And then after that, you see the snowfall, which is the rendering of the bear's fat. However, that's not Narragansett tradition. I began to probe what is Narragansett tradition for this? And I went to, how many of you know the name Roger Williams? Yeah. 
Roger Williams wrote a book in the 16, well, it was published in the 1640s, called Keys to the Language of America. It was published in England. And he studied Narragansett tradition, Narragansett language, and it's written up in the Keys to the Language. And what he says is that there are two words for bear. One is moss, and the other is pakunawa. Well, I know moss to be the word for bear, but I couldn't figure out this pakunawa. And then I looked at it one night, and it was two words, pawa at the beginning and the end, which is a word for medicine person. Mm -hmm. And then the word in the middle was kunum, which is the <coughs> the word for a spoon or a ladle. So this was a medicine person's spoon or ladle. My inquiring mind went further. And I'm trying to figure out if this is the artificial horizon line, and if in fact this is Big Dipper, and if during the equinox, autumn equinox, these three stars rise up above this artificial horizon line, what might it be telling us? And what I arrived at, not necessarily being factual, but what I arrived at was that the medicine people would have used this as a part of determining bare medicine for a patient. Mm -hmm. That these would have risen, and as you probably know, this constellation makes a 24-hour turn every 24 hours. It turns in the sky, 360 degrees. But it's only at this time of year that its handle is perpendicular and rises each day above this artificial horizon line. So I am surmising that medicine people would have been utilizing this to establish a prescription for a patient. Now, I haven't gotten confirmation of that yet, but that's my active in the mind at work. What is this? A whale. A whale. The eye bottles. And the whale's bridge. Now, this we encountered in West Denver. It's wonderful to have part of your brain <laughs> in the audience. It's, it's 70. Five, I'm starting to lose a little break now. <laughs> we were on a gas line project in uh, this town, and uh, the gas line monitor, our guide, our caretaker, our keeper, <laughs> was telling us, don't go out of the right of way. Don't go out of the right of way. And of course, we were going out of the right of way because the stones were taking us out of the right. Before we walked down into this area, there, were, there was a flock of ravens that came in. And I said, okay, well, this is auspicious. There's something important down here. We were walking down here, and as he's telling us, don't walk over there, and then turn back, and he's doing this weird dance. Well, he was fighting off yellow jackets. <laughs> 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 And he was standing about here, and as I turned to see him doing his weird dance, I recognized that we were looking at the effigy of the whale. Yeah. Now, why would tribal people have a whale effigy here? I don't know. That it is a whale? I don't think we would all agree. Mm -hmm. Does it have something to do with where whales used to live? I don't know. Did we have relationships with the creatures of the sea? The answer is yes, we did. We had covenants with all the creatures of the sea. 
We don't need any more. We ought to. But this whale is where it is. And we've seen whales in other places. You've met this guy before. <laughs> This is in the town of Dallas, Pennsylvania. And that's what ceremonial stone features look like in Pennsylvania, one of the farms. And it's a beautiful barrel-shaped stone feature. And I've been called there because the family that owns this pristine 3,000 acres wanted to protect it from gas line. The gas line wanted to come right across their property. And so, they contacted me because an archaeologist who did, does work for the Delaware tribe of Oklahoma had come there, had spent several hours, and had indicated that this was the result of stones migrating down the hill. <laughs> <laughs> so they contacted me and uh, said, uh, Mr. Harris, uh, is, would this be important in the work that you do? I said, well, we would consider it ceremonial. He <coughs> said, well, this archaeologist said it was the result of stones migrating down the hill. I said, well, the stones are very intelligent, aren't they? <laughs> um, I went there along with um, a <coughs> representative from the Wampanoag tribe of Gay and Aquina and a representative from the Mohegan tribe and one of our field representatives. And, uh, the family um, put us up for a day and a half, uh, and we walked their property, and we saw these and other features that were just phenomenal. Um, I also provided for them a recommendation of an attorney, and after quite a bit of money, um, he was able to protect their property from the being a part of the gas line. Mm -hmm. This is the last slide. And, uh, it's here because this language is a part of our multiple property list, and we've been battling with the National Register over that language. Because the multiple property cover indigenous American ceremonial landscape sites, districts nominated under this cover, shall be identified or confirmed, analyzed, and certified by tribal historic preservation officers or tribal authorities. That seemed logical. And it was mainly logical and should be in the tribal multiple property listing because this is what the National Historic Preservation Act says. Mm -hmm. The National mm -hmm. Historic Preservation Act states agency officials shall acknowledge that Indian tribes possess special expertise in assessing the eligibility of historic properties that may possess religious and cultural significance to them. 36 CFR, Part 800, 4 C1. That's a, it's a national act. Why can't it be dealt with by the National Register? Well, the chief of determinations, who at that point was the keeper of the National Register, said it would not be legal. What do you mean it would not be legal? He said, it's not a part of the black letter law that gives us the right to do what we can do. But if you can convince the states to include that, if what they send to us, then that will be accepted. So we're now in the process of having dialogue with the states to get the states to accept that. And these are the four tribes. And that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs>